Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books, the kids' fiction imprint of Cannon Press. Time for another pleasant half hour with <laughs> stories and We're soul back. food. We're back. We're back. Nate's extracted himself from the slew of writing and projects. On the slew slew. Our topic for the Stories or Soul Food pod today is inspired by a book you assigned in rhetoric class back in the day, in which I also have assigned. The Painted nice. Word by Tomas Wolf. Or the Tom Painted Wolf. Word. You remember that one? Yep. Um, uh, I remember. I remember the Painted <laughs> Word. We were kind of discussing in art how basically they strip away everything that makes art visual and turn it into a concept or an idea. Yeah. And your your daughter made an observation that I wanted to see if you agreed with. Okay. <laughs> she said- Any Let's me and her fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it actually pl- plays into a, a, a listener question as well. The question the she said, hey, every time you start a creative project with an idea, it fails, as in like an intellectual idea that you want to flesh out. And then she might have not have said it quite so strongly, but she said, it seems like if you want to head into a book with an idea that you're going to capture post-millennialism or for you with your work, you want to capture the, the magic of, of everyday America, um, that that is not what makes a good book. And heading into it with the idea, the desire to do that is not so much the way to a successful story. This plays into I think I think that's well, actually I think that's that's completely fair, which is why you don't do that when you sit down to write. So it's you can you can begin the project can germinate. So a project can germinate from an intellectual idea. But when you're actually putting paint on the canvas or you're actually photographing or you're actually putting words on a page, at that moment you better not be idea like in any kind of intellectual concept. You have to you have to be in something far more concrete by then. So Okay, gotcha. I want to make kids in America realize that the entire world is magic. I want to bring classic fairy tale structure to middle America in 100 coverage. That doesn't if I mean you better not start writing <laughs> with that in mind, right? Yeah, that's yeah. you can't start writing there. I have to I have to start writing when I've got my character in fleshed with his particular brokenness and his particular setting. When my location is a character, when when my location has the strength of the strength and characteristics of something truly compelling and concrete, and when I have figured out the journey and the arc and everything else, so those kinds of intellectual things are layers of typology and things that you're going to weave in that are going to be revealed there. But I think she is in fact correct that if you do if you do function creatively in uh, an idea driven way, I think you're going to break down. Yeah, and you're gonna and, fail pretty quickly. And are you gonna fail on the level of you didn't actually have a story to tell? Is that the problem? Yeah, you you sh- you should have turned to a different medium if you wanted. It really, to really is. Express. I think the struggle between form and content, and where you have and th- this gets into so many things. So I know you have plans for today's podcast, but it, we'll, can, it can go anywhere. No, we'll, we'll it can we'll, go anywhere. <laughs> we'll get to those. So this this kind of, I mean this comes into Christian storytelling in a major way. And a lot of the Christian filmmakers and Christian writers, Christian producers, I know this is the single struggle. I'm having a lot of conversations with producers about the brand of Christian art and Christian storytelling and so on, and have had those forever. Um, I'm in a unique place because I failed completely when I tried to write in the Christian world. Nobody wanted me. Uh, (laughs) They they only wanted me in Babylon. And I didn't really realize it's it's probably because I was raised on the blues and rock and roll and the Old Testament. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> savage. <laughs> and I, I really do think that's the case. I actually told my dad recently, I was like, you know, I, I, I fi- it finally dawned on me where, well, this, this is a whole big sidetrack. I'll just throw this out there that the brand of, of creative content and art that comes out of this place, Moscow, Idaho, and, and myself and my friends and creators who are drawn here is the kind of stuff that gets made by, true believers and Christians who listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan and B.B. King mm. and ZZ Top. Okay. We, got, we Leonard, have to dig and, deeper. And Leonard Skinner. <laughs> what are you seeing like, in there? What is as it? opposed to contemporary Christian music. People okay, who yeah. went through adolescence and through their creative yearning uh, with a particular 
Like it's just meat marinated in different, you know, different sauces. Mm -hmm. So you marinate the meat before you throw it on the grill. And I happen to be marinated in uh, the blues and rock and the Old Testament. <laughs> just tragedy with an edge. Is that what you're looking yeah, there's at? A, there's a lot. Sorrow. There's a lot more. There's a lot more of an edge. And I've done. I've done a lot of analysis and research of story, and I've done it uh, subconsciously, consciously, formally, informally. I've done it to teach. I've done it to write. I've done it to analyze market. I've done it in all sorts of ways. And I recently turned in a, a, a big fat deck uh, explaining explaining a lot of what makes content really compelling across demographics, what makes us a story or a show compelling across demographics, and, and how you are guided by that as a creator. But um, and some of it's what we talked about last time with Pixar, where they really capture the brokenness of adulthood, where they successfully, in classic Pixar, they hit this bittersweet brokenness of adult fears. So they layer adult fears on child wish fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a really powerful combination. Right. Um, but anyway, this is, this is all kind of like a, a bit of a distraction. But coming back around to the question, when you, when you get into Christian storytelling, so many Christians are okay with books or movies or music because of the message. And they think the message sanctifies the, the message, the, you know, the content sanctifies the form. So because the content is pure, like the intentions of the artist were holy and they wanted to say something, uh, you know, true. Uh, I guess, I, I mean, I guess that's technically true. <laughs> like mm -hmm. whatever they were going to say, that's technically true. The message is true. Uh, pornography is bad. This is my movie about how pornography is bad. Right. This is my movie about how abortion is bad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those things, I'm going to say something true. Then they forgive because the content is like, circle the T and not the F, they forgive all the inadequacies of form and the, the complete immaturity and uh, weakness of the actual storytelling. And then on the flip side, my more successful industry friends, and I have a lot of them uh, who are believers, are far more forgiving of really filthy content than I think they should be because the form is so sophisticated and excellent. And so if we jump all the way back, I don't remember what number it was, but that podcast we did on how, on how to watch movies, mm -hmm. and we talk about the balance between technical and objective and response value. We have plenty of, I have plenty of friends, plenty of believers who will admire a film or love a show because there is sophistication of form, excellence in form, even though there's filth of content. And then there's far more Christians who forgive the, all the crappiness of the form the inexcellence of the production, the inexcellence of the prose, mm -hmm. you know, the, the complete inadequacies that are apparent in the form because the content is, you know, is on track. And I, so I, th I think that what you started with, the question you started with about like, if you have an intellectual purpose, if you set out with an intellectual purpose, that's something that we see in left-wing propagandists and evangelicals. Mm. Like we see yeah. people inside the Christian market do that. And we see people in the hard leftist, you know, circles, do right. that. you know, where they, they set out to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make a movie that's, you know, damns the Bush doctrine, right. of, you know, of foreign wars or whatever. I'm going to make a movie that does, you know, fill in the blank is against the Patriot Act. I'm going to make like, now it's going to suck. Like It's just going to yeah, suck. Yeah. That's my thought. It's almost like the theme's too small. Yeah. Like if you wanted to write a movie, I, so what you're saying is so if someone came to you and said, I want you to, to make a movie, a full length feature that says abortion is bad. You'd say, no, that's not how full length features work. Or I'm happy to make a movie that's pro-life, but it's not going to look like you think it's going to look. Yeah. I would say, do you, how much money are you willing to lose? Mm. That's actually my first question. Okay. <laughs> Cause it because wouldn't succeed as I'm going to make an amazing movie. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Like, I'll, mm. I'll pitch you an anti-abortion film right now. Like, this will be great. Like, I've got one. Let's go. But it's not actually, as soon as you're going, it's not actually an anti-abortion film. As soon as you're going, it's a story of characters. Right. And it has to be the story of real characters living, you know, real conflict and real, right. real, a real journey. And then people watching it can say, wow, it turns out he's also not lying about abortion. Okay. You right. know, it's like, it's just. 
not lying, a movie that's not lying about something. Yeah. Because, I mean, think about that. Like, that's such a weird thing. Like, we need yeah. you to go attack this. Like, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, can I just, am I telling a story about characters and hap- I happen to tell the truth? I'm going to be telling the truth? Or am I, like, what, what do you want? What do you want from me? I, I, everything I do, I'm trying to tell the truth about everything. Mm-hmm. You're like, that's, that's right. what I want. Right. And I actually just recently went on a rant in the Lionsgate building about, about uh, oh, and incidentally, there's a whole big hullabaloo in advance of getting in that building, all sorts of messages and screeners and warnings about all the COVID Berlin wall protocols that were going to happen to try to get in there. Then there was nothing, but <laughs> they're just over it in Hollywood at the moment. But uh, yeah, so I, I went on a bit of a screed about how really great faith content would all it would be, and I mean this from the below the bottom of my heart, the basement of of my torso, the foundation. Yes, <laughs> uh, all that great Christian content would be would be stuff that tells the truth, Re- okay. like actual realism, like just real realism. Like realism squared, meaning realism that doesn't lie. So one example, the, the series Stranger Things, a little bit successful, right? Yep. Uh, let's, let's step into that world, shall we? And say, 1980s Indiana, a kid goes missing. Are there gonna, is there going to be a complete absence of pastors, churches, congregations, prayer mm-hmm. vigils? Yeah. Like, no, absolutely not. Yeah, we're in the, no, heart, we're in the heartland. Is the, this here. is 1980s Indiana. What are you talking about? This is even now, like 2021 Indiana, you'd, you'd have 20, sorry, it was 2022. This is insane. What just happened? <laughs> um, you'd have that today and even more so then. And so we jump back into, yeah, it's sci fi, but you try to present realism and you, enter, you, in, you inject this fairy tale magic and craziness and the, the insanity of the world into normalcy. That is the beauty of the Amblin, Amblin-esque story. That's the beauty of classic fairy tales. You, you create locations with specificity and universality that everybody can relate to. You create mm-hmm. these entourage relationships where there's all these different points of connectivity for viewers. There's a lot of different relationships. You have a fairly blank protagonist that's easy to, it's easy for everybody to relate to. You have a lot of quirks in the side characters, like right. Like that's it's it's all very carefully designed, but it's supposed to be normalcy, the real that you, you know, you actually right. interject this insanity. So let's just make Stranger Things, but with like a willingness to, in an unflinching way, be more realistic. Okay. And if you were more realistic about what people are like and what they do in times of crisis and what communities are like, you actually suddenly have a Religion. Is this a faith show? Yeah, Christianity. It's like, no, it's not. This is actually just a realistic show. You would have, a, you know, a priest would come over who happened to be a real jackass. You'd have another guy who was insightful. Mm-hmm. You'd have, you know, you'd have religious leaders who were absolutely narcissistic. You'd have some who were really sacrificed. You'd have a whole spectrum. Mm-hmm. Like, just tell the truth. Right. You're like, just, and that's what we don't do. So we just don't do that. We need, as Christians, we just need to stick to telling the truth. And in telling the truth, everything creeps into everything. Like our view, our view of the world and our belief about abortion and homosexuality and everything else, it, it's latent. It shows up in everything because mm-hmm. we want to accurately and honestly reflect the world. I was reminded of when the Queen of Sheba shows up at Solomon's court, she is convinced by the culture of his court. It's like food. Yeah. It's the food. It's how his servants are dressed. It's the architecture. It's his wisdom, of course. Yeah. But we tend to think like, oh, well, we don't think of a- apologetics in those terms. Yeah. So especially um, if, if we're thinking about story and art, if somebody like sets out the message first, great. Okay. Now they need to set that aside. Okay. And yeah. it's going to be over there while you figure out incarnate characters. Yeah. Something real. You, you, you're you yeah. not telling the truth. Some of the most pleasant book book request submissions I've gotten are from people who agree with everything that I agree with, but they're the worst book idea. So their most yeah. pleasant submission, yeah. agreeing with everything that I agree right. with, but not a good book idea. So if you say, I want to tackle abortion, like uh, in fiction, great. Okay. I, I'm not super interested. Who are you talking? Who are you going to tell a story about? 
Right. Like, which character? Juno's already been done in that yeah, sense. Yeah, which character are you going to tell us? Where are we focusing? And you tell them the story about the abortionist. You tell them the story about the girl. You tell them the story about, you know, the baby who survived. Yeah. You tell them the story. Like, what, what story are you telling? You know, there's going to be abortion in here in the story. That's fine. Whatever. But I don't care. You about, can't, about you can't the make topic, me care. The topic, I'm a, yeah. Yeah, I'm a yeah. human being. I sympathize and connect with narrative the way God intended me to, not via enlightenment suitcase handles. So, like, I, I am an incarnate, enfleshed person, and I'm going to relate to characters and track with characters and understand story via my senses and imagination the way God wanted me to. Because that's how he tells me stories. So I, I walk around all day and he tells me, he gives me inputs through my senses and I use my imagination to construct images in my brain and that's how I function. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, this is what we have to be focused on. So I think too many Christians and too many Christian films, Christian shows, Christian books, you know, Christian music end up just focusing on the holiness of the message, the holiness of the content, and that that somehow absolves all of us from any need to be excellent. Yeah. No one would say that. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say Christian novelists or Christian, even yeah, musicians too, but filmmakers, novelists, and so on who will say, you know, it's going to be, you know, I'm, he's a, I'm a believer, so I'm going to do this story, but it's, you know, but not cheesy. <laughs> like, I'm going to do this, but not. I'm going to do this, but not cheesy. It's like, that's, that's also a terrible way to go about something. Okay, like, so because then they have this, uh, they're reacting away from what is a bad idea and hoping that it's good. Is that, is that why that's a terrible idea? A, they're revealing their insecurities and they're actually probably going to do something really super cheesy. But B, you shouldn't care if it's cheesy. Like, you, you care if it's real, you care if it's compelling. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, you know, it's like, so it's, you're, you're meaning if someone reacts away, say, from the film about, you know, pornography and marriage is bad. Yeah. You know? And they're saying, I'm going to do that, but not cheesy. It's going to be like fireproof, but not cheesy. Right. Okay. That doesn't mean anything, actually. Yeah. What do you mean? I don't, I'm trying to interpret that. Does that mean you're going to do it with nudity? Does that mean you're going to do it with an edge? You know? And what it means is you're embarrassed of fireproof for some yeah. reason. And so you're it trying mean, to cover it, your- What it tells me is that you have an inadequ inadequacy as a human, and you're susceptible to cool shaming from the world. <laughs> like better, I want to, I want to make a. You movie. better define cool shame for all. I, of us I, here. I want, I want to make a movie my mom can watch, but I want to be a hip kid in Hollywood. I mean, there you go. That's kind of it. Cool shaming is uh, the lever that everybody uses to get everybody else to behave when they're like afraid of being a dork, afraid, <laughs> afraid of being unhip, and using weaponizing the fear of unhipness, uh, weaponizing that against creators. So that they can all be made to behave, um, and they they become cowards. This is incidentally, as a side note, why we should make all aspiring Christian filmmakers go naked for three years and only eat locusts and honey. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Old Testament school. So if we just said, okay, here's shame. my Christian film school. My Christian film school is you got to become grotesquely uncool. <laughs> 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 Right, grotesquely uncool and willing to be offensive to everyone, like everybody. Yeah. You cannot be somebody who's super palatable to the 35-year-old housewives of Nashville. You have to be offensive to everyone to be a real prophet and truth teller mm -hmm. and willing to just burn it down. I mean, just yeah. a willingness to roll like a minor prophet. I mean, I think that's how it's got to be. Yeah, I was Jeremiah, you know, spending time in the pillory. That's not the cool place to be, yeah. you know, out in front of town. You're not looking like the hero. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, just hang out somewhere super public and cook all your food over poo and, right, you know, without clothes. Yeah. Without any clothing. Yeah. Three years of nudity will make you slightly immune to the opinions of others. So when you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you say, oh, I don't care if I'm cheesy unless I'm cheesy on accident, right? No, what I'm saying is, Yes, that's that's a good way to put it. I don't. I mean, why would why would cheese be off limits? Yeah, I mean, it's a whole food group. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole food group. Uh, let's just put it this way: God tells some pretty cheesy stories. Yeah, where it works out well. Yeah, I mean, nice I plugged, I plugged American Underdog on this podcast. Right. I really like that movie a lot, and I like that movie a lot because, um, and John, the director, would say there's plenty of places he could improve it, and because we're all human, of course there are. 
But the story that was lived, the story that was actually lived, the story that was actually told by God through that guy's life was pretty cheesy. Yeah. But it's it also too was nice. a, it's but too it was good. also intense, intensely yeah. bleak. And the the moments of uplift were earned with, with some dark times. <laughs> um, you know, so that's uh like why why is cheese a no fly zone for Christian storytellers? Right. It it shouldn't be. Uh sucking should be a no fly zone. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna we don't wanna be bad. We don't wanna be idiots. We want to imitate God's tastes. So we want to love what he loves and hate what he hates yeah. and so on. I'm wondering, you mentioned musicians, and I'm wondering if uh, we're, you know, your father's preaching through the Psalms. Yep. And he says, hey, compare a contemporary CCM song, which says you are holy over and over, yeah. with the typical Psalm, which actually tells what happened to the Israelites. Yeah. You know, as a, it's very concrete, very concrete, precise. narratival. Right. Yeah. As opposed to what we tend to think, we tend to think the systematic language is better. Yep. But that's not. Because we're dumb, Brian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> Seems like God seemed to think it, you know, a little systematic language is great, but a whole lot of story is way more important. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and so you have, you know, one of the first great songs of scripture is all about drowning Egyptians. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a pretty concrete yeah little tune there yep uh and then you move on and you have things that repeat like that you know it's like there's a reason why we can locate different psalms to different parts of david's life mm -hmm. like we can actually be like oh, this, this is... was after this yeah. bad guy murdered this yeah, entire like town of priests of, like go through and be like oh this is okay yeah. yeah i see i see this i see the other thing um but we do have as as believers we have and actually forget believers as post enlightenment uh abstractionists uh, we tend to pursue the idea first and it really is terrible. Yeah. So, and is again, that it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if a, if a novel occurs to you because you think I want to come up with something that hits on the following themes, right. like that's fine. But then you got to actually roll up your sleeves and get into something real. Okay. And, so and that's where our question Ryan asks, how do you write characters slash plots that aren't simply bullet points to the point you're trying to make? Right. Uh, you know, similarly, when you create a story, do you have a grand point in mind that you enflesh with characters and plot? And he says that's what C.S. Lewis is doing. Or do you have a character sketch or place or scene you want to give a world to? Like I don't think, I'd say I don't think that's what Lewis is doing. Yeah. Um, so read that line again. Yeah. Um, or s similarly, when you create a story, do you have a grand point in mind that you enflesh with characters and plot? Maybe more like C.S. Lewis writes. Yeah, that's not what Lewis did. Yeah, he seems to start with characters. He and the thing is we are we shouldn't divorce any part of ourselves from what we're doing. And so if you believe that the most beautiful thing is sacrifice, self-sacrifice and atonement, it's when you're chasing something beautiful, it's going to show up. Right. Uh, so you so, so you're saying the idea of you know him saying I need to have a lion die for these kids to rescue them is not what Lewis started with. Probably. No. It's, uh, uh, but it could have been, but it, if he, if it was, it would have, it would have appeared as, as an image, as a scene, right. not, not as an idea. Right. You know, not he would the, have, oh, he would have woken up from a dream in which he had seen, you know, children weeping while a lion was sacrificed on a table. You know, it's like, right. then you, and I've had that kind of thing happen to me before. Then you start chasing like where, what kind of story would that fit in? You're like, man, where, what would come before that? <laughs> what would come? Yeah. What would come after that? And you start. But what them. he didn't do is think, hey, we need to write an animal story that matches the life of Jesus. Right. No, I, I mean, again. Yeah, he was not trying to, and he was, so he was not trying to write with any kind of theological precision. He was not trying to get any kind of one-to-one -one allegorical correlation. You know, it was imitation of the architectural shape. He followed this architectural shape of the, the ancient gospel story and did it very, very differently. And when you set out, there's, there's two things that happen when you're starting to write, and you want to you get your handles really, really cleanly, and those handles are really character first, but character and location and particular brokenness and problem, mm -hmm. like both internal and external. So what are, your, what are your points of internal brokenness? What are your points of external brokenness? And then you actually, from there, construct the architecture of the journey. Right. So the, sh the shape of the journey. 
And when you're constructing the architecture of the journey, that's actually when you can borrow from the gospel, from mythology, from other from other ancient places. Um, Lee Pike Ridge, I borrow from Tom Sawyer and uh, well, Huck Finn. Really, everybody says Tom Sawyer. Mm-hmm. A little bit of Tom, um, Tom and Huck, and uh, I borrow from Twain. I borrow from the Odyssey, and then of course I I have some resurrection themes and so on. So you're, you're grabbing shape and architecture, and then also just references, just illusions. Yeah, um, and the belief that certain things are satisfying. Yeah, you know, that that certain things actually bring about catharsis for the reader so you're like oh i will have this kind of death and resurrection death and resurrection because death and resurrection is compelling because it's true and god laced it through everything and he loves it and so i'm going to use yeah. it yeah and it made sense in the story you were yeah. writing and exactly so what you do is you you take your character you take your location you establish your brokenness you establish your external difficulty and conflict your internal conflict and then you start, as you write, you start trying to map out the shape. What's the architecture? What's the shape? And, and it could be as you write your first draft, or it could be as you edit, that you're going to try to find your shape and make sure that your architecture works. And right. that's where actually there's plenty of opportunity for uh, references, typological references, and so on. Yeah. yeah actually, it's, it's funny you mention illusions right now, because that's what Ryan also asked. He noticed some kind of cool stuff in Ashtown that I wanted to see if He's picking if up it on it. was real. Yeah. <laughs> I also actually, one, one additional comment there is that I kind of ribbed some even jelly uh, impulses to just have a simple Sunday school message, be the, try to be the beating heart of a story. But more sophisticated believers often find a typological image as like they use, they use that the same way where it's like, oh, there, see, there's, there's a typological architectural echo. Like, see how this is shaped like mm-hmm. that. The shape is the same. And so, therefore, it's holy and good when actually it still kind of sucks. It, like the fact that it okay that it typologically imitates something bigger and more ancient doesn't make it good any more than a little Sunday school message would make it good. None right. of the none of the things like that, none of the abstractions where you could distill a shape out of it, right, uh, or a, a reference out of it, or a Sunday school message out of it. None of those things sanctify. The whole. None are of are you referencing and, the G- TGC article on Encan- Encanto? Did, you know, did you see that one that just came out? One of our listeners was saying, "Hey, I don't think I've read TGC in forever." So, <laughs> one of our listeners posted it. It's an article basically saying that the character. Let's not talk about Bruno. That Bruno is Jesus, basically. And mm, they yeah, ran. That's through, a relief. And they ran through a list of. So they concluded with, "Let's talk about Bruno rather than let's not talk about Bruno." Right. And uh, it's, it's sort of what you're doing. It's saying, yeah, even if he is an ostracized, ostracized character who actually is holding the whole world together, that doesn't mean it's a good story. Like, even if he has a, Je- a slight connections to Je- Jesus's life. If he and- imitates the shape. Right. Somebody imitates the shape, that doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. The Antichrist imitates the shape. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, like, w- yeah. w- I mean, whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so... It has to, you have to actually be telling the truth. Yeah. The whole thing has to be speaking truth. Like you have to be honoring the honorable, damning the damnable, loving the things you should love. Um, and you want to be, as, as we break it down, you want to, you want to be objectively pleasing God with what you've accomplished. You want to be leaving the viewers or the readers better than you found them. Like you want to be impacting readers and viewers for good. You want to be objectively pleasing God and you want to be excellent in your work. You're right. You want to actually have technical excellence so that you can stand up and hold hold your head up and say that you're honoring your creator who made you and who made right. the world with excellence that you also are pursuing excellence. Right. Anyway. Okay. Quick question. You can tell I can we... rant about plenty of things. <laughs> I love this. it. It's There's good. plenty of rantability here. <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay. So Ashtown, Ryan's pointing out, you've got one-to-one. Gilgamesh shows up real life yep. and in Ashdown. <laughs> That's an easy one. And it's actually the historical Gilgamesh. Most people don't know this, but he did achieve immortality and he did play in the NFL under multiple different names and is in the Hall of Fame, I think twice in my story. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yep. All facts. True facts. Good. Facts. <laughs> uh, then second, you've got some hidden ones. So Big Ben Sterling, Long right. John Silver. Yeah. Right. Um, and then some seem very subtle. He says, you've got Diana sleeping at Cyrus's feet in a Ruth Boaz moment. Oh, look at clever Ryan. Yeah. And so he's wondering, don't give stuff away, man. (laughs) (laughs) When do you underline what you're doing to the reader? And when do you drop Easter eggs? 
That's his question on that. Because it's, I mean, it's what it's it's your imaginative soil of of the mind. Yeah. And so, in that sense, sometimes kinda, it's Easter eggs, and sometimes it's Easter eggs that it's just there because you want the books to yield a harvest for multiple reads. You you know, you want people who read it again ten years later, or they read it further. And I've had I've had people literally tell me that they've they've read it, you know, eighteen times or something there. Mm-hmm. Some absurd number. Because I'm now old enough that people can say, I first read this book when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so over, you know, a decade or however long it's been, it's not been that long. Maybe it is for the first one. Um trying to do math in my head right now. Like we're getting there. Yeah, when was Lee We're getting close. We're getting close. Lee Pike was two thousand seven. Yeah, yeah, Lee Pike was fifteen years. Yeah. So with the, with Lee Pike for sure, with Ashtown, I was like I've had people tell me they're close on like must be like their twentieth read. Whew. It's a lot of reads. Because they started when they were twelve, you know, the day it came out and they now are reading it to, you know, little siblings or cousins or whatever. Yeah. Um and they've noticed they just noticed something. Like they just noticed something. Well, that's gotta be um, re- that's gotta be rewarding too. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you want so there's some layer to it where you wanna just drop texture and depth to it that if people continue to peel it away they continue to find pickles in the cellar there's more there's more stuff down there um but and some so some of that's just for me to enjoy the time i'm spending in that world but a lot of it is intended to be revealed and what you want to do is be speaking to the subconscious more than you are trying to uh riddle something for the reader i'm not trying to like riddle things I'm either overt or covert. And when I'm covert, if I'm overt, it's for fun and for laughs and for texture like Gilgamesh is just inserted. When I insert Gilgamesh early as I do, really early in the series, I'm letting the readers all know what kind of story this is and what kind of characters they can expect. Because it would be bad if you brought him in in book two. Right. I have to start. If I'm going to do this, I have to start early. I have to start doing this early and that enables me to bring in Maxi, you know, that enables me to keep doing things with Robespierre and Ponce de Leon and, and all these other characters that I, that I want to use. So I have to establish that tone and set the rules of engagement. You know, like this is, this is this kind of story. This is this kind of world. What is the universe? And so you do some, you do some overt stuff there to establish that on an imaginative level. But then there's also those things that you want to lay down subconscious influence so that people all anticipate a climax or a crescendo that's coming and when it comes feel the satisfaction of its arrival and so some of what you're writing and some of what you're lacing in there is like the water sucking away from the beach Mm -hmm. yeah it feels like oh it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse but everything's it's all coming back yeah and so when you're going in that that second half of the book and you're in that you know bad guys close in and everything's getting worse and dark nights of the soul all around and people are dying and things are going bad it's like the waters are just receding like it's it's going the wrong direction but everybody's anticipating this you know the the wave to come back they're all anticipating the break and you want to set it up such that in the wash afterward not only do you answer questions like you you've hung threads and you answer questions that people have you also give satisfaction so it's not a, a thing of like oh i knew these people were going to end up together you know it's it's it wasn't a riddle you right. actually have laid down kind of subconscious references and some conscious ones that make them want it mm. you're making the reader want particular things so i'll just give away a secret here no reader in my entire career has ever told me they really wanted cyrus to end up with hillary drake nobody nobody right. wanted that if they had i would have failed right you try to you're trying to lace things in on a subconscious and a covert level with little touches of overt such that people are anticipating and excited for certain resolutions they're looking for particular resolutions right and they want it to resolve certain ways and you also want to resolve it in ways that they don't necessarily want mm-hmm. like you you want to kind of come into these resolutions sideways you want to stress them out freak them out yeah and actually still satisfy all the desire that you've created for the reader so you're and saying so, one tool is to get that romantic type set up yeah so diana boone sleeping at cyrus's feet is something that is 
noticed by some and affects all. Yeah. So some people notice it like, oh, but everybody is affected by it. But you didn't head into your book writing and saying, I need to tell a Ruth story with my main characters. That's something. No, that's that's, the kind of, that's actually that I could have done any, I could have done a hundred different things. Right. There. Right. Uh, The point is when you, it's like a, it's something that's more symphonic where like, when do you use dissonance and when do you use, when do you bring together uh, harmony? Oh, well, you're, you're trying to bring satisfaction. And so as, as I work through silent bells and it's, and it's, I've been derailed, um, hopefully I'll be, I'll be back in the trenches very shortly, but I've been derailed by this TV show. Um, as I've been working through silent bells, the thing I'm chasing the thing, and it's a rough draft I'm working through is basically, uh, laying down track to bring about various cataclysmic resolutions that are not the way people expected it to resolve but does in fact uh bring about the satisfaction yeah that, harmonizes that, with what came that it brings about the satisfaction to the thirst i've created to the hunger that is created when when you bring to have it when you have a brother and sister and they're super tight and you have all this dynamic and then you separate them people are yearning for that you, you get them to this place where they really want this reunion right there's lots of ways that you can you can do this. And this is this circle. We can derail all the way on to Harry Potter. This is one of the reasons why we all know that Harry should have been with Hermione. <laughs> You've made people upset with this. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, everybody knows this. They all know it. It's just, it's just their loyalty that causes them to squirm. So, and I, and I understand it's like, it's not that, it's not that Ginny wasn't eligible. Yeah. And it's not that he didn't save her. Of course he did. But who was his actual spouse through the entire series? Like func- functioning as a as a the the other half. Yep, as his better half the whole way. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So you're saying the typology there is almost at war with the typological rescue from the basilisk is at war with the the rest of the the book, right? Uh, sort of the flesh of the the flesh of the narrative. Yes and no, but this is back to typology. Like, get over the typology. The typology yeah. is that's a donut sprinkle, right? You okay. know, ty- typology yeah. is not. Um, you know, it's not a promise. Yeah. It's not a contract, but it does like me having Diana sleep at Cyrus's feet. It does set up a certain anticipation that creates conflict. So it does set up Ginny as possible and creates a triangle of, of expectation and, and possibility and, and friction, but yeah. he, can, he can only choose one and, you know, hot tip. There's a lot of heroes in the world and in the history of the world who've saved more than one chick and they don't have to, marry them all all. (laughs) you know it's like it's like this is this is the way it works so um yeah the jenny situation that establishes jenny as a girl who's going to be crushing on harry it creates a social awkwardness of it's his best friend's sister and it's something that could be utilized and capitalized on you know in future stories and and so on as we get to the as we get to the end and just kind of wasn't um yeah you know, like it was just underutilized. So it sets her up. It does, it does like set up expectation and tension of like, which one will it be? Mm-hmm. Um, and, Cho Chang. <laughs> yeah. It sets up a wishbone that's going to break, <laughs> but she doesn't really, she doesn't really uh, build from there and just has it jerk into, into the wrong direction at the end. Yeah. So, well, there we go. Yeah. So I did the, the moral here is if you want to be a writer, if you want to be a Christian filmmaker, do not start with a moral. Do not start with, a lesson and if you do make that mistake uh it's not like a you know a mortal sin or anything but if you do start there you need to get concrete really really quickly and then establish your context your your setting your characters locations brokenness journey everything else and then you just need to tell the truth yeah just tell the truth right tell god's truth that's it and if you can do that fantastic you'll you'll have written great stuff and you'll have made a great movie and people will look at it and say this isn't really a faith film and you'll say right it does not fit into that particular market niche as the prussians say uh, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's like saying in my uh, story good conquers evil right and and congrats <laughs> yeah good good for you <laughs> um and it's this is one of the the things that's so frustrating you know, and a lot of the propaganda that people buy into, there's all, all the, the happy fulfillment. People can be deeply broken, deeply flawed, and yet we tell stories in which they're, they're actually well-adjusted and fulfilled. 
And we say up is down and down is up. And we write these narrative catechisms to try to convince people of this. And it's really, I mean, it's just sad. So, I mean, it's, it's a mess, but that's what our culture does. Our culture just like leans as hard as it can, uh, telling lies, uh, with conviction. And then Christians tell stories and they think that they can't tell true stories. You know, they can't tell a story where a pastor is a, you know, a jerk, like, because that means they're on the other team somehow. It's like, well, there's plenty of pastors who are jerks. Mm-hmm. Like this is, in God's story, there's a lot of them, but there's also pastors who aren't. And so you should have both. Mm-hmm. Uh, like set up the frame. Where do you put the edge of your story? Where do you put the edge of your narrative? What are you, you know, what are you doing? Um, one, of, one of the stories that brings me the most pleasure is even Jellyfish, the story of John Mitchell, yeah. little, little Baptist pastor, having to be Jonah to his particular Nineveh, who happens to be Chad Lester, a megachurch pastor who's just the worst. So his, his Nineveh is a megachurch pastor, and he's, you know, he's just a, a normal little guy pastor. Like it's a very, it's great. It's comic. It's funny. It's comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's true. Like there's truth there. Like there's yeah. guys, there's guys like both of those guys. These characters exist in the world. Totally. Uh, and I, I love watching that play out. Is it a faith story? It's just a true story. Right. So focus on that. Truth. Get into, get into concrete incarnate narrative and just tell the truth once you're there. Peace. Shh. Hi, it's Brian Cole here, wanting to let you know how you can support the Stories Our Soul Food podcast. You can do that by checking out Canon Plus. Head over to mycanonplus.com. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the SASF podcast. We'll hopefully be seeing you at mycanonplus.com.